Hi, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of a virtual Zoom meeting. I have Patricia Miller with me, and she is a fellow Apraxia mom, Apraxia advocate, just all around amazing uh, person. And I was talking to her the other night, and she was telling me that she had, was finding some really great resources on um, resources that parents can utilize when trying to advocate for their kids during this unprecedented time. So, um, Patricia, if you could go ahead and just, you know, introduce yourself to my readers and um, tell them a little bit about you. Sure. Well, thank you for having me. So, as Laura said, my name is Patricia Miller. I am a 12th year teacher in um, Urban School District. I also hold my reading certification. I'm working with uh, the Wilson program to get my dyslexia certification. I also fulfilled the requirements to become a principal down the road. And I'm currently a doctoral student working on my dissertation, which is focusing on apraxia and support groups. I also have a son, Jack, who's six. They're, I have twins, Jack and Paige. Jack has apraxia. He was diagnosed with uh, suspected apraxia when he just turned four. Uh, it was confirmed last year when he was a little over five that he has uh, confirmed childhood apraxia of speech. And he also has sensory processing disorder, autism, and dysgraphia. So... Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. So I think that the reason that I love having you on here to talk about this topic in particular is because it's a really hot topic right now, basically because everyone is kind of having a hard time. So, uh, you know, teachers and school personnel in the education realm are feeling stressed and overworked. And not only are they stressed and overworked, now they're stressed and overworked having to also manage and watch their own families and their own children. And um, parents, conversely, are stressed because they're having to teach their children while possibly working as well. And when you have a child with special needs, like you and I do, seeing all of the time and money and just energy and everything that they have put forth so far to get where they have, you know, to get where they are, to see that potentially regress <laughs> or regressing before your eyes is extremely distressing. And so... I feel like it's nice that you can offer both perspectives because this isn't a blame teachers. This isn't a blame no. parent. No. This isn't a blame anyone. Right. This is simply how can we get the kids that, you know, have these additional disabilities the help that they need during this unprecedented time. And it's not meant to blame anyone. So right. I like that you have both sides and can offer that. Yes. And I was just having the conversation with a friend last night about, um, when Jack was three and he first started in the uh, early intervention preschool program, things were not going well at all. Um, we had a really horrible experience and long story short, we had to get an attorney. She was involved for two years and when Jack started kindergarten, um, we called them the dream team because we finally had, you know, an SLP who was very willing to work with our private SLP. She was, she really wants to learn and she's learned an awful lot so far. His special education teacher is a sibling, has a sibling um, with intellectual disability. So she's an advocate on top of being uh, an educator, which is awesome. Uh, him and his paraprofessional have such a great relationship. So I was saying we finally got somewhere. We finally are making gains and now we're stuck at home. That's exactly how I feel, actually. It, it was very similar, except I feel like we found her, what well, we did, we found her dream team in kindergarten, and we've had that same SPED teacher, that same speech language pathologist. Um, we have had a few other providers come and go, but I mean, ultimately, the, the SPED teacher and the para and the speech language pathologist are phenomenal, and, you know, the district has put them in a position where they cannot provide telehealth services. They can only provide um, Zoom consultations and mm -hmm. then work via Google Classroom. So it's been really frustrating. And I haven't seen Ashton regress, but her private SLP did notice some slight regression. And it does send you into a little bit of panic knowing how sure. much we've put into this. And considering it's only been, you know, a few weeks to maybe a month, uh, you know, we've been out since March uh, 13th. Yep. And, and I mean, it's, Jack started to have some regression in behavior, a lot of uh, work avoidance, mm -hmm. um, 
things come up like that. So it, it is very challenging. Um, I'm going to speak from a teacher um, standpoint right now. So, you know, when this all came down, at first it was, oh, we're going to close for a few days. We're going to disinfect. We're going to go back. Everything's going to be fine. Then we were kind of going week by week. Then the whole, um, you know, online platform became, you know, reality. And my friends and I feel like we're working harder than ever because it's basically learning how to teach a completely different way that we weren't trained in, mm -hmm. but we're doing the best that we can for all of our students. Uh, resource teachers are modifying packets, providing um, assistance via telephone, video uh, conferencing. We use Microsoft Teams. A lot of people aren't using that one. My children are using Google Classroom. Um, but you know, it, it is very challenging on the teacher's uh, standpoint. You know, there's only so much we can do. A lot of kids don't have internet access in my district. So we have to also provide paper packets, um, you know, calling them, checking in, do you need help with something? Trying to do video lessons to post because a lot of them are sharing devices for those of them who have devices. So I'm making videos of how to go through the math pages or how to do our reading assignments. Um, so it's really like thinking out of the box, but also too, as educators, we have a responsibility to every single one of our students. Mm -hmm. So just because we're not in school, this is still technically being considered, you know, their schooling, it's counting towards the number of school days. So if we were mm -hmm. in the classroom and we were modifying in the classroom for them, we have to modify now. Yeah. Um, which again can be challenging, but you know, um, it's just we have to do what's right by our students. Now, from a mommy standpoint, <laughs> and also part of the um, uh, administrative background, all students, every single student, doesn't matter what student, they are required to have a free and appropriate education. Faith. Yeah. That has not gone away since the pandemic. The Department of Education has stated that in no way should the pandemic be an excuse to not provide services to students. And while there are many things I don't agree with with Betsy DeVos, she actually said something that I agreed with that <laughs> teachers should really be innovated and in trying everything possible, including online distance learning uh, to reach all of their students. Um, there's, I can share here one document that um, has an awful lot of information that I was pulling from just now. While you're sharing that, can I ask you a quick question? When we talk about they should be providing, you know, the be like online services to children, you know, are we talking about direct services via Zoom? Are we talking consultations? Is that a vague or ambiguity in the law at all? Do you know? The problem is, and that's why we, I have some um, stuff to work around that. The uh, Department of Education hasn't mandated how to provide the services, right. but if we kind of read between the lines, there are documentations, including this one, that, you know, gives some information on, you know, the best way to provide for our children. Um, right now, obviously, we can't. Um, Trying to pull up the right this next not the one hold on one second sorry um you know keeping keeping um in mind you know like occupational therapy and physical therapy right now just health wise for the child and for the teacher it really can't happen right now mm -hmm. but you know trying to provide some other activities again kind of falls on the parent because right now some of Jack's goals are cutting coloring, pasting, and handwriting. Right. We have to do all of that with him. And right. he, with the dysgraphia, he despises writing. Like all yeah. weekend, he's like, no writing today, woohoo! Uh -huh. um, and another hard thing for us parents is we're not the teacher, we're her mom. Yeah. And it's a huge adjustment for them is that they just want us to be mom. They don't want us to be teacher. Oh. Um, that's something that I've come to find. So, um, there is information stating that if a district cannot provide the services as they were pro being provided before this pandemic, 
um, compensatory education um, will be something that should be addressed at your next IEP meeting. There's um, a document from, uh, again, the Department of Education making a lot of different um, accommodations as far as FERPA, our rights for our children. Um, you know, Can you explain FERPA to everyone real quick? I think um, people are usually familiar with HIPAA, but not necessarily FERPA. Oh. So um, FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. So this basically makes sure the school district is not, you know, sharing information about a student um, with other teachers if that child doesn't even have that teacher, making sure records are confidential when they're writing emails about the student, uh, you know, not using their name, whether they use an ID number, that sort of thing, um, and just keeping things confidential. But now with teletherapy as an option, uh, school districts are having parents put in writing that they agree to have their child participate, whether it's Google Classroom, Zoom, um, those formats, you know, just to ensure that they understand that other children might be seeing, you know, them talking and their work and that sort of thing. When in regards to special education, if a child is, say, working in a speech group with four other students or three other students, um, you know, the parents are going to know, oh, so-and-so also has speech and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so there's been a lot of um, accommodations made as far as that goes. Um, originally, um, Skype, Facebook Live, and Google Hangouts we're not uh, considered falling under the HIPAA um, way of doing teletherapy because they're not as secure. But President Trump has put in writing that if that's the only option to use for teletherapy, he will waive any sort of, you know, if something happens, um, that the school district would not be held liable. So um, with this outbreak, just talking um, about there are some schools that were shut down for a very short period of time. So for instance, if a school was shut down for two weeks, the school district wouldn't necessarily have to provide uh, the resources and the services to uh, the students. Um, if it does go beyond the 10 school days, which is then considered a closure, um, then the IEP team, the PPT team, I mean, they need to um, come up with a plan. And one of the recommendations from the Department of Education is they're not required to, but they may want to include distance learning in their IEP as a way to ensure that they are providing the services that the child needs. If the child does not receive services during this closure, uh, then again, they would have to, you know, at the PPT table discuss compensatory education. Um, if for instance, so if a child breaks their leg and they're out of school for two months and they receive uh, resource room hours, speech hours, occupational therapy, they usually get what's called homebound tutoring. So it might not necessarily be their provider. They try to make it their provider just to keep you know continuity. Um, but they, you know, they go to the house, they give them maybe an hour, two hours after school just to keep them caught up. Mm -hmm. So obviously a lot of people can't go to the houses right now. But again, you know, when the child physically cannot be in school, there's been things put in place for quite some time. So I don't understand a lot of the pushback from the teletherapy. You know, if it's they're afraid of something happening with, you know, like I mentioned with the FERPA, you know, as long as it's in writing, but truly the way that, especially for our kiddos with apraxia, ASHA speaks a lot about the code of ethics, ensuring that the student is getting the best proper uh, interventions possible. And telepractice has um, been around for quite some time. A lot of school districts, um, Rural, rural school school districts were brought up a lot. You know, the travel between one school to another is just not possible. Right. So they will use teletherapy as a way to help the students with uh, their speech services. Um, I know for my daughter's, um, and for her school district, the school district has mandated that all the service providers 
provide the same thing that the gen ed peers are getting, which is a Zoom conference and then Google Classroom assignments. So each service provider has been providing Google Classroom assignments, but then of course it falls on me to essentially do it. And um, they, I did call my district on like Friday or Thursday and talk to the head of the speech department and ask, you have, um, you know, potentially people who are willing to do telehealth, but the district's policy has been, no, this is what we're doing. Can you explain that to me? And the explanation that she gave was the district adopted something called asynchronous learning, which means that um, it's an, she said it's an equity issue where if they were to provide telehealth, telehealth could only be provided within, you know, like let's say the eight to two school hours. And that would be unequitable to the children of parents who might be working and couldn't have them attend those telehealth sessions during that time. So really the buzzword to me seems to be all around equity. And if it is around equity, I would argue that my child needs a one-on-one -on -one para support and she's pulled out of the classroom, you know, for X amount of time. It is not equitable for my daughter to just get packets like all the other gen ed no. peers. No. And I'm glad that you brought that up because that's actually where I was going because um, Asha put a lot of information in, where is my other one, um, about the way that the services are provided. And the Department of Education said that the way that services and even just learning in general was provided, it should be in the same you know, continuity and rigorous and what have you, as it was as if they were in the classroom. So That's the biggest thing- really interesting to me because right. they only told our, they were charged with maintaining. There is no expectation that they will grow. I think that's almost, I think I have an email in writing that says the district, you know, is mandating that teachers simply maintain skills that their children, that the students that's have. That's ethical and that's not meeting their IEP. Right. So right well, this is, yeah, this right. is even to have gen, true of gen ed peers. Yes. Um, that's, we still have an, so teacher hat, we have an obligation to still get our students ready for fourth. Well, I teach third, so we need to get them ready for fourth grade. Mm -hmm. We are not just reviewing skills that we've already learned. We're still teaching, like we're teaching the rest of our fractions unit right now. We still have to do measurement. We have to do um, with graphing and that sort of thing, problem solving, multi-step problem. Like we can't just stop because what's going to happen next year? is the fourth grade teacher going to teach half of third grade and then they're right. just going to be six months behind? Like that just doesn't make sense. Like, are there, is there going to be gaps? Yes. It's of course. unavoidable. Right. Um, especially with lack of devices, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. I know in my district, my superintendent is actually looking for some funding to get some sort of after school tutoring and possible half day Saturday class to kind of fill in those gaps and catch them up a little bit. So I know a lot of superintendents, wow state are talking about something like that just to kind of fill in those things because as of now ESY is up in the air right. um, for you know they're already talking about any summer camps that they're having will be outside and now mm -hmm. I don't even know if they can really have that because of the number of students but oh. we should not be um, you know just stop teaching and just kind of maintain that just that's unethical as a teacher and as an educator to me for them to say that is kind of goes against the teacher's code of ethics. Right. Um, so one of the examples, and this is why we can kind of finagle this, the wording a little bit, they gave an example in that first one I showed from the Department of Education supplemental fact sheet. If a student is blind and they have to have they, they can't read the packets. They can't read what right. the screen. They would then have to have someone read the material to them, either in a recording or live off of a, you know, a screen, telephone, what have you. So with our kiddos with apraxia, it's in numerous ASHA articles that, and even in this fact sheet that um, speech and language falls under telehealth and teletherapy as a, through either um, virtual or even if they're getting a video of the child and then kind of giving feedback, which is not the most ideal. You kind of really right. want, you know, um, the live FaceTime. 
but our children, they need the auditory feedback. They need to see yes. the teacher's yes. mouth. It's not something where they can sit there and, you know, practice saying a bunch of words that does no. not help at all. No. So that's the biggest push is, you know, according to ASHA, children have to have a multi-sensory program. It doesn't state which type of program. You can use multiple types of programs, but it has to be multi-sensory. And if you take out teletherapy and that visual one-to-one, -one, or even if it's a small group, we're going to see a lot of regression in our kiddos and they work so hard as it oh. is. It, it would, it would just be really, really frustrating. And I know with my son, his teachers were willing to do the video conference yes. because their hands yes. were tied because yes. the district was telling them no. Yes. And I don't know for sure, but it's my assumption as an educator and a parent, it always comes down to money. Mm -hmm. They look, they don't look at our child as a child. They look at them as a dollar sign. Mm -hmm. And when I was fighting for him to have his para work with him, I said, stop looking at him as a dollar sign. He is not a dollar sign. He is a child. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm in a really good position with the super, the current acting superintendent because he used to be one of my teachers and he was my mentor. So I have help in that regard, but coming up when I'm going against the head of special ed, like she doesn't want to hear it, right. you know, uh, at first. And again, our SLP is amazing. She started advocating for the teletherapy for his, um, you know, because of his apraxia. She's like, I can't give him packets. He needs to see me. Yeah. He needs my, you know, um, like watch me round your, you know, round yeah. your lips, that sort of thing. Um, and then I kind of helped, you know, drive it home. You know, and I was getting the whole, well, he's one of the only ones in the district getting teletherapy for speech. And I'm like, okay, well, then why aren't the rest of them? That's a whole different topic. Yeah. And, and then also, too, we're not talking about other kids. We're talking about my child. Right. <laughs> so, you know, like his, his parrot is amazing. She drops off packets of extra work for him. She does the work with him. She takes videos that he can go along with. I mean, if... There are, so it, on my teacher hat, there are teachers who are uh, reluctant to go on video because there are things, I mean, you know, let's say, God forbid, you know, they're, they're doing their video thing and there happens to be, you know, a bottle of wine in the kitchen in the background. I mean, that can be blown out of proportion. Right. Um, if there's some sort of a painting up or something I mean you know it can be blown out of proportion yeah you can still do the audio conferencing so right. there's a lot of different options especially if the teacher is not comfortable with that and a lot of my colleagues aren't comfortable going live and sometimes I'm not comfortable going live like I don't mind doing videos to send to them yeah but it's also you know you have to teach the students you're still in the classroom, you need to dress appropriately, you need to talk appropriately. Um, but there are many different ways of providing this. And basically what the Department of Education also said was, the if you were giving direct services for speech and language, for, you know, for our um, the AAC devices, they still need to have those um, therapies. Now, each state has, and I, I sent one of these uh, links to you, and I believe they were posted in the uh, main Apraxia Kids Support page. Each state has their own guidelines. They're very similar. So they're not going to mandate how the services are delivered, but they still have to be delivered in some manner. If right. they're not, then again, it's our job, which is a huge job, is to then document no OT this week, no speech this week. And then you have to then do the math. How many hours is that? And then the compensatory education. My stance on compensatory education, again, this is my teacher hat. One of my students somehow fell through the cracks and they changed, resource teachers changed that year, some left, whatever. He didn't receive services for a whole year. Mm. So granted he got his 160 hours the 60 for math and 90 for reading that still doesn't make up for the fact that he lost a year of extra help yeah, right and it's it's hard for him because it's after school that we provide the uh the compensatory ed you know tutoring if you will 
it's a lot for them. They're tired. They already had yeah. a long day at school. And really, we, we don't want them regressing. So right. unfortunately, we do have to kind of, you know, put on our boxing gloves, so to speak. You know, we try to be polite about it, but then it just gets to be the point where it's like, okay, they're not hearing me. So we just kind of have to just say it how it is. Because yeah. then there's, you know, if they're getting 15 minutes for motor planning every day and two pullout sessions with a group, then that means everything would need to be increased the next school year, which means more time for them out of the classroom, which isn't fair. And then, mm -hmm. you know, possibly the need for more service staff. So yep. if we kind of go from it as a, hey, this is where we are, we don't want to go backwards and we don't want to issue next year, like what can we do together to yeah. provide everything that my child needs? Yeah. So like me with Ashlyn, she definitely should have her para checking in with her daily, even if it's just for a little bit. Jack's para checks in with him for about a half an hour. Uh, she'll do some of his um, data tracking, that sort of thing. Um, but our kids need that. They have these bonds with these these people these teachers and they're not understanding like no. jack doesn't understand why we can't go to the park he doesn't understand why we can't go to uncle joel's house um you know anytime someone comes to drop something off he's ready to run outside and go say hi to them and i'm like no, 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 don't go no. so it's all very confusing for them and even my daughter you know she's had a lot of anxiety she's been having bad dreams and things are just very you know it's very different like we're trying to keep it as like you know cool and calm as yeah. possible yeah. but, but they like, know it's unavoidable yeah, yeah. like when no. am I going to, why am I not back yet I know. so you know as as much as it's hard for the parents and the children and the teachers um we we really do need to work together at this point um because we we can't just be told like oh sorry we just can't do it because we're home that right. that's that's not an option that's right that's, that's not okay um, from a parent standpoint, from a parent standpoint, it's a lot of work for us. Yeah. I mean, as a teacher doing everything for my students and then also helping my biological children, because my students, I call them. <laughs> I know. Isn't that funny? I do the same thing. They're like, <laughs> they're, they're, our kids know. Isn't that cute? I wanted to write a blog post on that. I know I'm, I'm, I'm like taking a little tangent, but, um. My kids will say, like, did you have a lot of your kids today? You know, but they realize they're my actual kids. But those, yeah, I know. Kids, those clients are your kids. And Ashlyn has a written relationship with all of her service providers. And uh, when even, you know, for some reason, the service provider, the special ed teacher last week was allowed to progress monitor. She can't provide direct telehealth services, but she can provide direct progress monitoring. So, I mean, go figure that. But anyway, Ashton was super excited. And when she got off the phone, like, I just heard her be like, oh, I miss, you know, so-and-so. I miss you so much. And it just, like, made my heart break. I know. Jack, Jack has a very close relationship with his SLP. And it's funny because she did her um, student teaching, if you will. I don't, I don't know the exact term for SLPs. But um, she knew him when he was three in the three-year-old program. Mm. So they have this connection that's, like, no oh, other yeah I mean, you know it's i love you miss alex and he's blowing mm. her kisses and what have you and you know when the zoom meeting is done he gets mad oh. like he'll either go in his room and kind of cry or sometimes he'll actually throw things and get yeah. really mad because he he misses her and he's like my yeah. miss is gone she's gone yeah. well, no, she'll call back so it it is really hard and yeah you know we we can even use you know the social emotional aspect i mean that's a huge buzz phrase social emotional learning emotionally this isn't okay for our kiddos mm -hmm. like this is hurting them this is harming them in more ways than them just regressing in their services right um, so, you know, a lot of it is going to fall on us parents, but I don't think that we're not used to not providing extra exactly. help. Exactly. You know? <laughs> totally. It, it kind of comes with the territory, if you yep. will. So even if you put it out there, like, I wouldn't mind doing the carryover. I wouldn't mind sitting there and facilitating the meeting, you know, if it's possible. I know it's hard for working parents, but even if, you know, somehow, even if it's a again, it would fall on us, but if they do, so we use Flipgrid, 
mm-hmm. with um, his therapist where I will do some sort of an act, like a language activity with him, like a game, and it'll record, and then I can send it to her because it's also data collection, and then, um, you know, then she could provide me with feedback of, okay, let's try this, let's try that. So we do have to be very involved and very hands-on, and if the district knows that we really are invested in this, they might, you know, be a little bit more um, willing. But again, it, they are getting pressure from above, yeah. And, and anything that's going to cost more money, and you know, things are so up in the air right now with um, budgets and yeah. that sort of thing, which. So it, it's hard because being on both sides of the ends of the spectrum, bottom line, all of the kids should be getting what they deserve and what they need. Yeah. So I think my takeaway from this is I want professionals to know that parents aren't necessarily blaming professionals when they're advocating for their children. And I think a lot of professionals who don't have a child in our situation actually take it that way. And it's rarely meant that way. But for the parents, I want them to know that it is hard for educators. And this is, like you said, even for me as a speech language pathologist doing telehealth, it's exhausting. As you said, I wasn't trained in this. I've never done therapy this way. I can't say that it it is the best I can give them right now, but it is certainly not ideal. And, you know, teachers are thrown into that too with their own children at home in a lot of scenarios. And so I think that the message, if I could say to sum all of this up, is we can still advocate for our children, but we can do so in the spirit of um, coming together for solutions and recognizing the importance and maybe the stress on the educator and recognizing the importance and stress on the parents and coming together to find maybe very unique solutions, but that work for both parties and not having, you know, a parent come in just demanding you have to do this or else. Um, But, but we do have some guidance from these resources that you have. And um, have you posted all of these resources in the large Apraxia Kids support group? Uh, Not all of them yet. I do need to go. I put the ones from ASHA and their stance on teletherapy and uh, the laws and mandates per state, which you can then go and see what your specific commissioner of education says. I'm going to post the ones from the Department of Edu- uh, the Department of Education in the United States. They're, in all of the three articles I'm going to post, bottom line, they're saying we need to be creative, we need to collaborate, and we need to give the best for our students in this unprecedented time. And I'll definitely post those, and I'll send those to you directly, too, so that you have them. Yes. So when I post this, I will have, I'll leave all of these in the comments for everybody to the links to the documents that Patricia had. And I just can't thank you enough for taking your time out to do this. You're busy oh, mom, yes, busy pleasure. special needs mom, educator. You have so much going on. I just really appreciate you taking the time out. Obviously you're doing this for free to help our Apraxia tribe and our community. And I just really appreciate that so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And if you do have people reach out, you know, please feel free to um, send them my email or, you know, connect us on Facebook because my goal is when I went through the period of time I went through with Jack and fighting and fighting and fighting, I don't ever want a parent to ever feel the way I felt because I didn't find out about Apraxia Kids and other support groups until I was like halfway into the battle. Right. Um, So you're not alone. We're, you know, we're here for you and we are a family, if you will, you know, and we will do what's best for our kiddos. It just might take a little bit to get there. Yes. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Like you said, if you have any questions, feel free to email me and I can shoot you um, Patricia's email as well. Thank you so much for joining us, Patricia. Thank you. I hope you have a good night. You too. Bye.